Welcome back to Decompression Basics. I am Dr. Pete and I am the voice behind the Chem Doctor. What I'd like to do in this presentation is answer the following two questions. The first is, what is on gassing? And the second question is, what is meant by saturation. All right, and uh, to answer these two questions, I'm going to take the point of view of a chemist since that's what I am. And so I'm going to define some of these things. I hope to be more clear, um, but I'm going to use uh, a chemistry point of view to answer these two questions. So um, in order to tackle the questions, uh, let me lay the, uh, the groundwork. So I've got a rough schematic here on the screen of an alveolus. So this is the air sac that is the ultimate final location where the, where the gas or the air ends up when the diver takes a breath. And uh, what I'm doing here is showing the, the actual uh, air sac um, which we're going to assume initially is empty. So the, uh, this is just prior to the diver taking a breath. And we're going to pretend that, that the airspace here is actually evacuated. I'm going to establish a volume on that space as being exactly one liter. And then we have a tissue that is in direct contact with that airspace. And for simplicity's sake, we're going to assume that the uh, tissue is uh, pure H2O. Now, I'm going to extend this extrapolation a little bit and we are going to, uh, prior to taking the breath, we've inserted a glass plate in here. And the purpose of this is that uh, what I want to do is go ahead and put air into this space and then we're going to pull the plate out of the way or we're going to poke some holes in it so that the gas that's in this airspace can communicate directly with the tissue and we're going to talk about what happens in that case. So let's go ahead and let the, let the diver now take a breath. All right. And when the air comes into, into uh, the airspace, as I described in the first presentation, the total pressure of that system will equal the ambient pressure, which is going to be uh, whatever the whatever the, the external pressure is where the diver is actually breathing on the regulator. And in this presentation, we're assuming that the diver is still on the surface and that the surface pressure is uh, atmospheric pressure at 1 atm or 760 millimeters of mercury. So, so under those circumstances, once the air enters the alveolus, as I described in the first presentation, the partial pressure of the gas mix mixture changes a little bit because of the uh, higher concentration of water vapor in the alveolus and the higher concentration of uh, carbon dioxide. So the gas that we're going to focus on uh, for this is the nitrogen because the nitrogen gas is the inert gas and this is the major concern for divers because as we descend in the water column the nitrogen dissolves in the tissues and, and as we ascend back out of the water column the the inert gas the nitrogen which is dissolved in our tissues has to come back out and we want it to come back out at a slow enough rate so that we avoid uh, bubble formation um, now before we get into the nitty-gritty of the presentation uh, I just want want to pause for a second and uh, you may want to pause the video and just calculate these, uh, the sum of these partial pressures, but you'll see that they total 760 millimeters of mercury. And then because I'm going to go back and forth between millimeters of mercury and atmospheres, I also provided the partial pressures um, as, as ATMs here, and they're going to sum to one ATM. All right, now... To, to just go back briefly to where we started. So we started where the diver had not taken a breath. We evacu evacuated the airspace in the, in the alveolus and I've got a glass plate in here. So this separates the tissue from the airspace. We're gonna allow the diver to take a breath now. The airspace is gonna fill with the gas. 
the partial pressure of nitrogen in there is going to be um, 573 millimeters of mercury. And now we're going to go ahead and poke some holes in, in the, the glass plate so that the tissue and the, air, the gas that's in the airspace can now uh, communicate. If we were to break this down now and look at what's going to happen, and I'm going to focus specifically on the nitrogen. So we have our tissue here, all right, and I'm going to, for simplicity, like I said, I'm going to let my tissue be H2O. Um, pure water and I'm going to ignore the presence of the other gases we'll come back to those later so the only gas that I have um, in my airspace we're going to assume is going to be the nitrogen and so I'm going to put some nitrogen molecules in here now once we pull the glass plate out of the way or we poke some holes in it I want the viewer to think about what's going to happen because at that at that point, we're assuming that there is no nitrogen dissolved in the tissue at all, and that all of the molecules of nitrogen are, are present now in a high concentration relative to the tissue in the gas space above the surface of the tissue. So common sense dictates that there are going to be collisions between the, the gas in the, in the airspace here and the liquid. And some of those particles, many of those particles, when they make collisions with the liquid are going to dissolve. All right. Initially, there's so few particles dissolved in, in the liquid uh, phase of this, there, there will be few, if any, opportunities for the gas particles that have entered the liquid and, be, and formed a solution with, with the water to actually leave the liquid and go back into the gas phase. But over time, that situation is going to change. And some of these molecules will have the opportunity, as the concentration builds, to, to leave the solution phase and go back into the gas phase. Eventually, what's going to occur here is that there will be a point where we reach what, what a chemist is going to call the equilibrium position or a steady state where for each gas particle that's entering the solution phase there's a gas particle that's exiting the solution phase back into the gas phase and at that point there's going to be no net change between the compartment holding the gas and the compartment holding uh, the solution alright now what I want to do is actually graph what that looks like so I'm going to put a graph over here and we're going to put two pieces of information on this graph. We're going to graph what's going on with the concentration of the nitrogen and with the partial pressure of the nitrogen. And we're going to put partial pressure and, and concentration on the vertical axis. So down here on the horizontal I'm going to have time. And what the time represents is I'm going to define a time zero and that's the point where we actually remove the glass plate or we poke the holes in it and the gas for the first time had the opportunity to start interacting with the tissue and then the time course uh, occurs over the time frame in which the gas enters into the solution phase and eventually we, we reach this steady state and the actual units on this for our purposes doesn't really matter it could be we could have measured this in seconds or minutes or, or whatever you wanted to do and then in terms of the of the vertical axis and I'm gonna put a break in here and I'll do that in a minute first I'm gonna go ahead and graph concentration of nitrogen and I'm gonna use uh, the symbolism that a chemist would use so square brackets to, to mean concentration all right, and so we're going to define the concentration of N2. And I'm going to be specific about this. We're going to define, and we're doing this using a square bracket. So square brackets in chemistry means concentration. And I'm going to define this concentration as moles of N2 per liter of solution. Now, I'm well aware that the that the viewer may not understand what a mole, what a mole is, so I'm going to define it here 
a little bit more specifically. And I'm going to say that one mole is equal to Avogadro's number of particles, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, you don't need to freak out about the size of this number, um, nor do you need to freak out about the use of this jargon in a sense. Um, the mole is like a dozen, and everybody knows that, that the dozen is just a simple grouping. A dozen is 12. In chemistry, we can't use a grouping that's small. Um, a dozen is small. 12 particles is a small number. If we actually tried to do calculations and understand complex processes, in chemistry using uh, a grouping like a dozen, it would be a very inconvenient way of representing numbers because uh, molecules and atoms are very small and small amounts or small volumes of them have so many particles in them. If we were dividing and multiplying by groupings that, that were, were small numbers, that just wouldn't work. And so our grouping is a large value like this. The main thing to understand when I talk about concentration it's a very simple concept. It's the number of particles that are dissolved per liter of solution. And I'm going to uh, abbreviate solution as S-O-L-N. So if we follow this process from the point when we remove the glass plate to the point where we reach this equilibrium position where there's no net change between the number of gas particles over the surface of the liquid and the number of gas particles that are dissolved, and by the way, that is technically what is meant by saturation. I actually don't like the term saturation. Um, I prefer the term equilibrium because it, it, it has a deeper meaning for me. But the saturation point for this gas is the same as the equilibrium point. It's the point where there is no net change between the number of nitrogen particles that are dissolved in the tissue and the number of, of nitrogen particles that are in the gas phase above the liquid. Now, if we go ahead and graph what this looks like, starting at time zero, we would see a very steep rise in the formation of the solution. What I mean by that is the, um, the concentration of nitrogen is going to be increasing rapidly in the solution. Remember, in the beginning, when the first molecules of, of N2 enter into the solution phase, there, there would be very few molecules moving back into the gas phase. So the line is going to rise very, very steeply. But, but over time, what's going to happen is you're going to see a substantial curvature. And the reason for the curvature is because as time proceeds, as I described over here, in my diagram qualitatively more and more uh, nitrogen is entered into the solution phase and and as time proceeds more and more of these particles are going to have the opportunity to to leave the solution phase and move back into the gas phase and as that occurs um, we're going to have a, a, a higher rate of the reverse transition the reverse transition so I'm going to for the first time establish a, a chemical equation that represents what I'm talking about. And the way I'm going to do that is by establishing the nitrogen that is in solution as ni nitrogen uh, aqueous. And we're going to use a double half arrow to indicate the relationship at saturation or the equilibrium point with the nitrogen that is in the gas phase. And the way that I ha I'm writing this equation we're writing this uh, equilibrium equation to represent the, the, the gas nitrogen um, at equilibrium or with equilibrium over the solution nitrogen. All right, and the double half arrow means that we're at the saturation point or uh, the term that I prefer here is the equilibrium point. So let me get that in here, equilibrium point. Now, I'm going to put a break in our line here, and I better extend uh, my vertical axis up a little bit higher. I want to talk about now uh, the partial pressure here. So um, going back to our original um, discussion, back to where we started this thing. So when I had my glass plate here, uh, if I would have sealed off 
my alveolus. So we let the, the diver take a breath. The, the, the air is inputted into this gas space. Um, it's, it, as soon as the gas, pa the gas space excuse me, has filled, then we go ahead and we, we uh, for the sake of this discussion, we go ahead and we seal off the alveolus. And then we poke the holes uh, through the glass plate and we allow the system to come to equilibrium. All right, if we handle things that way, then we could say that our partial pressure of nitrogen is going to start at some value. And that value is going to be equivalent to 573 millimeters of mercury. If you want to put that in, uh, if you're following this on a piece of paper, um, our starting point here would be a 573 millimeters of mercury. That, that would be the starting partial pressure or, or in atmospheres point. 754. And if we were following, and remember we've sealed this off for illustration purposes, we would see a slight decrease in the amount of, of, of the nitrogen in the gas phase because we're forming this solution. And the nitrogen particles had to come from somewhere. So you would see, let's see, I'm going to change the color of this, you would see a slight decrease in the partial pressure and that curve would have the opposite relationship to the curve we drew below. Um, whoops, I don't like how abrupt I made this. Let me just back this up a little bit and put more of a curvature on it. Remember, this is illustration. I apologize for my artwork. is not going to be the greatest. But you're going to see that the, my graphs have this, a very, they have very similar shapes, but, 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 they're, uh, but they're reversed because the partial pressure of the nitrogen is going to decrease a little bit and in the beginning the the amount of that decrease is going to be very fast and and both of these curves if you look as you get closer to T0 the closer that these two curves have to linearity and that's because their their relationships at that point uh, did not involve a, a reverse transition but over time again What's going on here, if we just talk about the partial pressure, in the beginning, the partial pressure is going to be decreasing in almost a linear way because all of the nitrogen that's in the gas phase is going to be involved in entering the liquid. Well, not all of it, but most, many of the particles are going to be involved in entering the liquid phase to form the solution. And over time, though, we're going to see a reverse transition because many of those particles are going to be coming out of solution as we approach the saturation point and re-entering the gas phase and that's the reason why both of these curves uh, have the curvature that they do. Now what I want to do is uh, draw a vertical line here and separate my graph into two different places that and and the description of, of what's going on in these two different places will be the subject of future videos. But we can draw a line here, and what I try to represent, all right, is the difference between when both of the curves are nearly linear. Like if I was to draw a tangent here, and, and granted, this isn't perfect what I'm doing, but if I drew a tangent here, you can see that in this portion of the curve, between here and here, that the... A uh, drop in the partial pressure of the gas, gaseous form of the nitrogen, is nearly linear. And in this part of my curve, for the formation of the solution, we have a similar situation. And where both of these curves ha are near linearity is, is where we have uh, formation of the solution going on and a slight decrease in the partial pressure of, of the gas that's above the surface of the liquid. And that's in the case where we have we have sealed this off and granted it's not really sealed in real life because the diver is breathing and so the gas in this air sac is is exchanging and in essence the partial pressure of the nitrogen is going to be constant at this value but when we look back at how we've represented this transition we can split what's going on here into two places in this portion of the graph this represents the kinetics of gas exchange. And like I said in future videos, we're going to talk about what this means. The kinetics defines the time frame in which the transi transition occurs between when the gas is entering the tissue 
and when the gap uh, forming the solution and when the gas is coming uh, out of the air sac in into the tissue the this kinetics aspect is going to happen anytime that we shift the tissue in and out of saturation or in and out of equilibrium and this is going to be happening when the diver is either descending or rising it in the water column and and we're moving the diver uh, in and out of a situation where the pressure of the gas over the surface of this liquid is being moved in and out of an equilibrium position all right and then this part of the graph which I'm going to uh, let's change the color and I'll put some arrows on it like this here this represents our equilibrium situation and this is what happens when the diver is at a, pl a position in the water column where the gas above the surface of the tissue has the time frame which is long enough for the gas and the solution to reach this equilibrium point where there is no net change going on between the nitrogen that is in the gas phase and the nitrogen that is in the solution phase. To finalize the discussion and close the video, I want to, to make sure, and I'm going to open this can of worms right now, that when in the papers that describe decompression science, they talk about Henry's Law. This equilibrium point that we're describing here, this saturation, is actually the equilibrium position between the nitrogen gas and the N2. And we can define that in chemical terms the following way, where K is equal to the partial pressure of the nitrogen. In, and I'm going to be defining this in my videos at, uh, in the units of atmospheres, divided by the concentration of N2 in molarity exactly the way I've described it in this video and this is I know we're getting a little cluttered here but this is actually Henry Henry's law constant whoops Henry's law constant and you do have to be careful when you're looking in the literature at Henry laws constants because some of those papers define this equilibrium uh, in the other direction and so therefore when you see the constants in those papers they're not going to equal the number that I'm going to give you here but under these circumstances my K value is 1600 and that's at a temperature which is at 25 degrees centigrade or for those of you that are not comfortable with centigrade that's about 77 degrees um, Fahrenheit and I realize that this is not our body temperature but in order to put numbers on this stuff and to to talk about this at the level that we need to I want to be able to utilize actual published numbers um, and uh, and those numbers were were defined at fixed temperatures of 25 degrees alright so with that what I would like to do is go ahead and close this video I'd like to thank the viewer for for watching and I hope that you will continue to watch my series so um, look forward to uh, Decompression Basics uh, 3 in the near future. Thank you again.